Hey, peace and blessings to you. My name is Jerry B. I am the Entree Musician and so are you. And absolutely, positively, so is this young sister we are going to have a great conversation with today. When you say Entree Musician, you're going to have to say Doris G. I'm telling you, she is the CEO and founder of Synapse Publishing and Entertainment, which was founded in 2017. But that's just really scratching the surface of everything that she's done in the music industry. I mean, from being a publisher, songwriter, record label owner, artist manager, involved in music and sync licensing. She's a talent buyer, event coordinator, consultant, speaker, and a literary award-winning book that she has as an author. She's done it all, trying to do it all, and I'm in awe of her, and I mean that wholeheartedly. Reese, what's happening, dear heart? How are you? Thank, thank you very much. What an introduction, Jerry. Thank you very much. But I, I'll tell you, the secret of doing anything well is focusing on one thing at a time. Even though I've done all those things, it's sort of been overlapping and intertwined. But 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 you have to give it your all to that one thing you're going to be good at at that moment. I don't want people to think, oh, she's done that all simultaneously. So. Uh, but, but thanks. It just means I'm pretty old. <laughs> I had a lot of time to do a lot of serial things. Aren't we all? Aren't we all pretty old? <laughs> I, I like that. I, I like that you bring people on that aren't just in their twenties on this show because it's it's kind of nice to feel like you have some peers around that uh, understand the perspective that you have, and That's I like that. Right. That's that's definitely right. I mean, you know, uh, the older I get, the younger, you know, I seem. So it's like, you know, it's, it's my peer group. Oh, my God. The AARP people won't stop, you know, with the circulars and emails. So. They, they have some good benefits, you know, you have to take advantage of those discounts where you can get it. Yeah. You know, as mu as musicians or music industry people, you know, sometimes we have to go with the flow and the money's not always flowing the same way we want it. So those AARP discounts make up breakfast at Denny's. You Hotel know? rooms, <laughs> gas, you know. <laughs> triple right, let's whatever. be real here let's be real <laughs> <laughs> honestly but you i mean you not only have you been involved in the music industry but you have definitely left a wonderful track record you are doing it well i guess the first question that you know pops in my mind every time I think about you, whether we're on a phone call with Barry Coffing, shout out to Barry, you know, when I saw you down in Houston at Springboard, and even when you were in, in our area, and you had so many wonderful stories to tell me when we had dinner together, my, the first question that pops in is, how did you get interested in music? I mean, how did you start? Were you, did you come from a musical family? What was your foundation? Um, I really started in the, I'll call it the entertainment business, not just music business, but the, um, I, I auditioned somehow for a play when I was in kindergarten. Um, and when I was in kindergarten, it was a musical. It was uh, uh, to be a sugar plum fairy in the Nutcracker for a, a Christmas play. And I had my little tutu and I was all excited and I couldn't stop listening to the music. They gave each of us a, a tape or something. It was probably a cassette tape at that time uh, to listen to and to just uh, really enjoy. And I loved the songs. I wanted to have piano lessons. I started taking piano lessons at five years old. And when I got on the stage the first time and I looked in the audience and they're singing and dancing and I just went, I'm never going to leave this. And so I, I really spent the first, oh, you know, 40 years of my career kind of on the other side, not on the business side, but so much on the entertainment side as a singer, uh, a dancer, a keyboardist, uh, um, just, just all involved, being involved in the arts and theater in college, being in plays as a uh, musical comedies and then plays and singing. And I was on a theater board. So it kind of all just grew into the evolution of eventually I was too old to do all that singing and dancing and playing and, and became where I wanted, I wanted to help. Well, you know, there's always community theater, uh, but, but there, but th there came a time where it was like, I, there's a few things I want to do that I haven't done yet, you know, go on tour 
and what better way to do it than to start a label and go on tour with my bands and to to make sure I was out there doing publishing, doing uh, the type of activities, talent buying, things that I could find. And I found the artists that I wanted to work with, the kind of music that I wanted to work with and have gr grown and learned and discovered music and movie syncing along the way. And so each discovery, it's a never ch ever changing dynamic world. And I just wanted to be part of it. So I gave up a lot of my day job work that I did in other things. And I always brought in music into those day jobs. Um, but I, I went really to go do it full time about, you know, nine years ago. And, and um, I, I love it. It's taken everything my whole lifetime learning experiences and, and allowed me to bring in elements of what I was good at to help others. And that's what it really came about me enjoying contributing back, uh, helping others, especially independent um, artists and musicians, especially women, independent artists and musicians. I have males as well. I, I don't discriminate uh, genres or, or, or people, but I, uh, I, I really enjoy helping people learn things that they haven't experienced before. So that's how it all started. That was the journey. Wow. And I, I, you know, I really do think that that's the key in, in longevity. If you're willing to help someone else understand the dynamics of this business, because it changes all the time. There's always something to learn. Uh, when you think you have it down, something else comes down the pike, especially recently. And uh, that's the one thing mm -hmm. that I found as I was researching your company is that your artists are happy because you help them because you create opportunities for them and not only the opportunity but you help to explain exactly what's going on so you get underneath and get into the why why this is important for you to do this gig or to record this or to you know brand yourself that way and that that's more well, of a that's 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 more of a, just a management role that really is mentoring and and helping right. them to grow you know what I mean? And, and I really do. I really do the least of the management role of anything. I really try to stay away from that. I try to be a mentor and I try to help people um, feel good about themselves, help people. So do you in your programs. Uh, I, I try to bring out what they do best. Um, I always believe that that there are no failures or fa people who fail. I believe that people have a skill. Sometimes it just hasn't been you know, eased out of them a little bit, or they're trying to do something else so badly because they want that to happen that they miss that there's another path that's really a better path for them. Uh, so, so I, I, I like that. I like that interaction. I like for my hands to be touching certain things. Um, I, I've worked for great big companies where I've, you know, managed or been involved with, you know, 800 people teams and $80 million budgets. Then I've worked with the one-on-one -on -one where we're barely scraping to get by, you know, uh, eat, eating leftover Jimmy John's, you know, in the back seat of a, a car and having no budget to work on. So I've seen I've seen both sides of it, and there's something nice about being in the middle. Uh, but if you're not, it's it's not so scary, you know. God provides, and and I believe people watch out for each other, and I believe that. Who you meet along the way is so much is more important than what you do along the way, uh, because those connections and those people connections, people often tell me, Dries, you have you have thousands of friends and connections. How do you keep up with them all? And, and, and most of the time it's like they pick up the phone. And even if I haven't talked to somebody in 10 years, it's like we talked yesterday. I, I, I find immediate um, uh, charismatic bonding with certain people. Other people hate me. <laughs> it's okay. And, you know, maybe the feelings mutual, maybe not. Um, but, but we all have to deal with that in life. We got to go, you know what? I, I appreciate you. I appreciate that you don't like my style or something. So you don't have to be on my friend list. Okay. Um, you got to be confident enough in yourself. Uh, I, I really think that for the most part, people are my strength and my secret weapon because no matter what you're doing, if you have somebody you can trust, you can build up, you can count on. Um, I, I, somebody asked me one time, what gets you mad? I said, there's only two things that get me mad. Two things that make me not want to work with a person. So if they've been dishonest with me or disrespectful, the two disses, I, I don't, 
I can't handle that. I can't handle that. You, you, you tell me the truth, even if it's painful and I'll, I'll be your, your, you know, backer forever. If you, if you disrespect me, I may tolerate it once, twice, three times, but at a certain point, you know, there's always going to be a distrust there. You see that disc comes back to you. You diss me twice, you return the disc and it's the distrust. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's um, an important thing to remember in this industry right. because there are too many people in this industry that have that lack of respect and they have that, that, that lack of, of ability to work with anybody else even. Sure. And, and, and I don't like it. And there's a lot of, you know, gray areas, not so much black, white, there's gray. And, and you have to know how to walk that tightrope uh, in there. So it's good. Now, when you were in Ohio, uh, you were on your way to D.C. And uh, were you on your way to receive a reward, an award or to present an award? My my reward in that that instance was just participating. I was just appointed to the uh, Women's Songwriter Hall of Fame Board of Directors, and I'm helping to uh, mentor the organization in some ways and bring an educational aspect and an organizational aspect to them uh, to honor all the women uh, that are, are recognized not enough in this industry. I know that women do get awards and there are women at the top of the charts, uh, but we represent only about 25 to 26 percent. I think it inching close to 27% of all the filmmakers and all the singers and all everybody. And I think that that's really a shame because we represent 50%, I think 51% of the population in the world and why we would only have half as much representation within a field that is so creative and so wonderful. It's not um, you know, like the, the debatable skills of, hey, do I have enough strength for this job or do I have enough, you know, X experience? Anybody can be creative. Anybody can be a songwriter. Anybody can be a, an actor, actress, whatever. Um, so it just continues to be shocking to me. And I experienced those glass ceilings. One of my artists uh, Delaney Basinger just wrote a song, Glass Ceiling. Um, it, it, women experiencing the same things over and over. It's hard for a man to understand that because you've not been in those shoes, right? Yeah. Um, but anybody who's ever had felt like a door has closed or disadvantaged because of who they are, whether it's the color yeah. of their skin, their religion, their size, uh, their gender, you know, yeah. anything... Um, I, I particularly am attracted to people who have come beyond the, that and, and fought that barrier and made it. So honoring songwriters, women songwriters was just amazing to me. We had some great people uh, there getting awards. I was privileged enough to uh, give an award to, uh, unfortunately, they didn't make it there, but the Mandrell sisters for all they've accomplished in the, the, the field of country music. And we had wonderful people um, honored posthumously, like Olivia Newton-John. Uh, we also had people there like Jan Daly, who in her her age that she's at, had performed with Bob Hope and all over the world, made such an amazing difference and come back from stage four cancer and just wonderful people. We had lots of youth there, Mariah Faith, who was on American Idol and uh, other young performers across the country, all women, all women, and honoring them, bringing them together. Dorothy Norwood was a wonderful, got up, had a had an amazing, uh, at, at age 80 uh, something, she got up there, 90 something, whatever she is, she got up there and she had everybody singing uh, her songs and, and just um, a highlight of the night. So I was thrilled for that. That was, that was my stop to, in Ohio on the way there. And uh, I, it was a great event. Great event. Oh, that's excellent. Absolutely. Now, tell us about yourself. When did you write your first song? How old were you? And well, do you remember the song? I am not a prolific songwriter. I would never be inducted into the Songwriter Hall of Fame. I, I have written a few songs. Uh, I have one co-written song that I have somebody that's uh, you're probably going to be recording that one. Um, I, I always wrote good poetry, Jerry. Here's the thing is that I, I won a poetry contest. I think I was eight years old when I won a poetry contest and um, it was submitted. I think my mother submitted it on behalf of me or something. The next thing you know, I got an envelope saying I won this poetry contest. It was the first of several that I, I won. 
and I want a hel helicopter ride. Um, uh, you know, and that was that was so cool. You know, what a neat prize for a little eight-year-old girl to win a helicopter ride. Um, so I went on to write several uh, songs. I did some kind of ghost writing songs and lyrics for companies and a few things like that. But um, I would not, I do that as an outlet. I was more of a, a piano player and I was more of an actress than I was uh, uh, anything else. So um, yeah, I wouldn't say I'd go down in history for my, for my songwriting, but I do serve as a muse to my artists and I often help them with a line here or there or something tightening up, a title you know, a rhythm. I've played some instruments on some albums. Some uh, I use Barbara Mandrell's tambourine. I actually won it in an auction. And I uh, played tambourine and shakers on albums. And, uh, you know, it's kind of kind of fun. I like to be a little bit behind the scenes in the recording studio. Being a label allows me to do that, you know, to work with great producers. Um, we're, in, we're in the studio this week in Nashville recording with Dale Penner um, and Andrew Salgado. So it's, it's pretty cool. And so uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited about the roles I get to I get to play with with music and songs um, and love to listen to songs. Obviously, as a publisher, uh, I like to hear that. Except it is weird that and we talked about this, Jerry, but it's weird. I don't listen to the songs in my car. I don't when I dr have long drives. I like to be in silence. Um, it's my reflective time. So everybody else listens to the radio all the time. And I, I listen to it at home. I don't listen to it in the car. So. That's, that's interesting. I, I don't listen to music unless I have to check it out. Um, I listen a lot to podcasts, um, you know, trying to learn and, and grow in this section of my craft. But um, my wife listens to silence as well. I don't, I can't do that. I have to have something. But, you, said. you know, you're driving. We from, have that oh, common. Right. Well, yeah, you're driving from Ohio to D.C. Yeah, there yeah. has to be something. I can't, I couldn't just do silence at all. Yeah. But here's a question that I wanted to ask with respect to getting into publishing, you know, uh, what attracted you most to publishing? <laughs> I'm going to call it, uh, some people won't like this. So I'm going to call it a necessary evil. I feel like publishing is the necessary evil of the way to get paid. Right. So people get their payments through the fact that there is a publishing component and then everything comes back through it. Uh, songwriters get get paid um, through through that mechanism and the rights to record things allow you to put things into albums or streaming or whatever. So it's the necessary evil. So I actually got started on the business side of that first only to get things all registered and straightened out and whatever. Uh, to me, the pitching of it and the music supervision parts of it came as an after development um, to the necessary evil of getting things registered and legal. I think people oftentimes give too little emphasis on the legal part of it and keeping everything straight that they need to keep straight. Um, and I work very hard at that because I, I am naturally not an organized person. So that is a tough battle for me to keep all that stuff straight. And I depend on more and more companies and people to help me all the time uh, with that. But the label part of it came naturally to me, the idea of making music and mm -hmm. being with creatives and, and helping find the right matches and helping pick the right songs. I have an ear for it. Uh, at least everyone tells me I have an ear for it to go. That feels like that. That's going to be a hit. That's really good. And I've been able to identify individuals and bands early on that I knew were going to make it. And mm -hmm. I, I, I wish I had enough um, skill or foresight to be able to have plucked them out. Maybe it's enough money to pluck them out of obscurity and be able to present them on the golden platter up. But um, I have had success in a lot of things that I've done, a lot of firsts for people and a lot of very big things because of just persistence, not saying no, being open ideas, and most importantly, learning how to pivot uh, with those things. Because um, as a publisher um, and, and label and that, you have to learn to switch what's hot, what's not. I mean, we got, look, we got a strike going on with the you know, uh, uh, screenwriters and actors and everything right now. You have to pivot when that happens and, and learn how to do other things. So it's all about this dynamic world we live in and how does it all come together, connect the dots. And how, how quickly you can juggle and learn to balance everything. Uh, mm -hmm. With respect to some of the artists that you mentioned working with, 
Um, what do you look for as an artist when you put those glasses on? What are you looking uh, for as an artist that you can you know, mentor? And, you know, what do they have to have? Because obviously there's an it factor, but that it factor may change from manager to manager or mentor it, it, to it, mentor. It's, it's hard. Different things attract me to different styles or different people or different needs right now what's going on where i where i see there's a need for instance post pandemic um there's a real need i think for some lighthearted um music some music that doesn't cause um uh, issues with fighting uh, and things like that there are some big songs in the news right now about that right that are um, going on. And I think sometimes, you know, more lighthearted, more loving, more upbeat, uh, that attracts me personally, because I like to hear those songs, those happy songs, those lively. I also, I love ballads too. I do love ballads. And, and But you're, ta you're talking about the product, but you know, I'm talking about the person, you know, the qualities person. that the person must have the, so that you can well, say, I, Hey, I would love to yeah. work with this person. I have to have the bandwidth, first of all. Okay, so they have to fit within my schedule. So if they're a type of person that demands, you know, 24 by 7 attention, that's not going to be the person. I need independence. I need people who say, look, I know you can do these things. I'm going to come to you when I need you. I'm not going to bother you 24 by 7. I'm not going to be asking you questions. I'm willing to work hard. I'm willing to be respectful. I mentioned it before. I'm willing to... Uh, you know, yeah, I'm willing to be honest with you um, about my feelings. Um, I want to show my vulnerabilities because songwriting has to reveal that vulnerability of who they are. Um, I want people not afraid to work hard. That means weekends, sometimes nights. If you always have an excuse why your, you know, your girlfriend comes first or why you're, uh, you know, you got a vacation planned and if something big comes up, if you, if you aren't going to, Make that exception and do that. I'm not saying you can't have life balance, but you've got to make choices sometimes. And it, it means sometimes conserving money the right way. So I'm looking for those characteristics in that person that's going to say, I want to put my career first. And, and if I want to put my career first and I'm showing you that creative love through my songwriting, through my behaviors, then, then they become that entree musician you talk about that's somebody that has that motivation to want to succeed. Somebody with a smile on their face. I don't want somebody grumpy and cranky and yelling all the time. And we all know that we all have those days and, and it's okay. But if you have them every day, I don't want to work with you. Um, so I, I want to make sure I have somebody that is, is, you know, a star in their heart and their brain, even if they're not a star reality yet because they're going to act like that. They have to act like that. You have to be nice to everybody in this business. You cannot make enemies along the way or let somebody see a side of you that's your private side. So you have to uh, be careful who you are. So as far as attracting, I mean, I don't think there's a magic formula, Jerry. I don't think there's one that says, you know, hey, because you are this age or this genre or this, you know, personality. I, you know, I, I can't put a label on it. You have to be unique. I can tell you that I want somebody unique. If you, if you sound, uh, for instance, and I'll probably get in big trouble for saying this, but if the, you know, there are some movements in some industries in pop and country, particularly where everybody sounds like everybody else. I hate that copycat stuff. I, I hate that. I do not want to hear if I can't differentiate you from three other people in your genre, then you're not unique enough for me to want your music. I want somebody that says, "Hey, I tried this little different thing, and I, I think it's, I think it's good. Listen to it, you know, whatever." And um, I, I don't take a lot of unsolicited music because I'm pretty much none, uh, because of the fact that uh, as a publisher and a label, both you, you're not really supposed to do that. Um, so if I'm hesitant to listen, it's only because. You haven't made the relationship with me yet. You haven't gotten me to the point that I feel comfortable enough to be able to do that. So it's not a never, but people who just said unsolicited stuff, I'm not going to probably make it to my desk. So <laughs> understood. 
Well, tell me about your involvement in uh, music and sync licensing. I know that there was a project, uh, it may be um, more, uh, that you worked as a music supervisor on, but how did you get involved in sync? I, well, because of my background with acting um, and also with um, software development, we talked about that a little bit uh, in, in business. Um, and I, I, <laughs> I was a professional speaker for many years. Um, my, my first involvement with it came in two different directions. Um, one was because uh, I had somebody approach me uh, to invite me to speak at the Toronto International um, you know, Independent Film Festival up there, TIFF. And um, I spoke on a panel um, about publishing and my love of music, similar to how I'm talking here about bringing together all the arts and someone was in there who ran a film festival and said, I just love it. And she was a female and she said, I mean, we need to have more people who think this way about the uniting of music and, and that. And shout out to Nan Pitts, who runs the Tennessee International Independent Film Festival. In fact, it's going on in a week and a half from now in Franklin, Tennessee. And I'm going to be speaking at that uh, conference as well. And uh, the Memphis Music Repository has a singing contest there that I'm going to be a judge at. So uh, Nan puts on a wonderful film festival with music videos in it, live music entertainment. Um, I've had performers in there. And I started getting on the sort of the circuit for film festivals and, and speaking and working with them. And uh, started during the pandemic particularly uh, to work with various people. Now, I, I wouldn't call myself really a flat out music supervisor. Um, I don't want to give people a wrong impression. I, I, I dabble in it. I play matchmaker between composers and, uh, and, and filmmakers and artists and actors and musicians to the point where sometimes I wrap my head around a project. I actually represent an excellent um, screenwriter with a uh, uh, television series and um, right now and 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 Susan does such a wonderful job of, of doing things so I have various projects going on uh, that involve music supervision um, Mark Barron who's been a mentor and a very good friend of mine in New, New York City has several um, films he's written uh, including wonderfully funny mega balls that we are waiting final financing so there you go anybody have some uh, interest in a great comedy about uh, some uh, Italian uh, uh, mafia guys who win the lottery. Uh, it's a great movie. And, and, uh, and so I just dabble in a lot of different things because I enjoy the variety. And, and believe it or not, the benefit of that is not that it's over time spent. It's, it's the connections, again, because one person says, hey, I can help you do this. And I love being a connector. I love being able to say, let me help you find this. Let me help you get on this tour. Let me introduce you to somebody that can do screenplay writings. Let me introduce you to this composer. Um, I, and they repay the favors. So this idea of how to network, how to educate people, you know this very well. You do the same thing. And, and I think we're very similar in that we bring a joy and happiness, uh, joie de vivre, you know, spirit, happiness out there that says we love what we do. We love Absolutely. helping other people. Absolutely. We just wish that there was days were long enough, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but sometimes I wake up at six in the morning and work till midnight. And and that is a workaholic. But it's somebody who just is immersed in love what they do. I know. Um, I got to tell it, you this. I was just talking to Lori, my wife, last night, and I said, you know what? We're at the end of July, aren't we? I said, August is right around the corner. I can't believe it because I really have not spent my summer. I've been my, spent my summer working, but you're right. Yeah. There's always something to do. I'm not on burnout. I'm not dreary because of it, but it's just like, wow, another day, another week, another month goes by. And it's like, okay, <laughs> you know, there, soon we'll be talking about the fall. You know what I mean? I know there's way more things that I want to do and I'm enjoying doing and don't have the time to do. People say you haven't had a vacation day in two years. Well, yeah, I'm a little burnt out because I haven't had that that, that shutdown. Um, and I don't know if I ever will again, <laughs> the way things are going. But uh, I, I'll tell you what, it's not that I miss it. I mean, I've had friends go on two, three weeks vacation every year and they're like, you gotta take a break. And, and it's true, I do, because it, it, it does get physically tiring uh, sometimes, but I I enjoy it so much that, 
there's just too much to do and, and too many people I want to help. It was just, so. it's just the other day, you know, I mean, I have, I have um, just affiliated with iClassical Academy and we did an uh, online open house kind of yesterday, right? And so I'm putting together material for, for them. And then I have uh, a gentleman that I love very much, Danny Sabella said, hey, I, I got this young kid. I won't be able to record. He has like a couple songs he needs recorded. Can you come out and do tracks for him? You know, and I'm like, yeah, sure. I mean, it's just like, there's always something to do. And he sent me some of the this gentleman's work. And it's like, wow, I'm, I'm calling him a kid because of my age. I don't mean it disrespecting him but you know it's like wow you know he he's pretty innovative so it's there's another opportunity that i'll spend three days of next week doing i have to make sure that my t's are crossed and i's are dotted but in the music industry there's always something to do and absolutely I enjoy it i really do me too me too that's the thing is that right now i've got i've got touring is like you know, so important right now in the industry for many, many reasons, but I've got a tour that I'm doing and putting together with just all women, all female singers, uh, different, some of them different genres. So it's going to be a very cool tour. Um, and then we're doing another one with mixed uh, people within uh, certain genres. Then we're trying to do a, a third tour with um that's the synapse star search so we're holding this competition that's going on we just extended it into 2024 because it's been so well received and we have so many venues um interested in working with us and different people and a charity working with us the raise a hat uh hand for ret um, uh, which is is founded by David Clements and, and Kevin Black, Clint Black's brother, that we're working with, with doing a photographic display of concerts of all performers and songwriters and concert. I mean, we're just doing so many cool things with it. And, you know, I invite everybody to check out what we're doing on my on my website, synapsepublishing.com. You have it there on the screen for everybody. But um, we invite as many talents as possible to apply for it. It's a free competition. That's the best part that we're doing. And it's got a big prize and the, the finalists are going to perform in Nashville and, and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun with it. Uh, and I, I just think those three things, touring and, and making people hear music, getting people out to venues, so important. We're still in a little bit of pandemic, right? Things are still closing down for COVID here and there, and they're going to continue to do that. But we got to help and break through that somehow and and get the performers comfortable. Everybody's gotten so used to performing on the screen in front of us that we we forget sometimes to, yeah, to get there in person and, and interact. And we saw that at Springboard, right? How much fun it is to be out with people live in the outdoor venue. I miss that. I miss yeah. going to concerts. Don't you? I, I do. But I've been I've been pretty much making up for them. I mean, oh, you know, me too. Like, to see you know what? Just saw <laughs> the Doobie Brothers uh, a week and a half ago, and uh, nice. before that, uh, you know, Stokely from uh, the band Mint Condition. Uh, you know, I'm just uh, you know when I can hit it, boom, be there because yeah. I do love and appreciate live music. This but he, this he next couple of weeks, oh, I, I got. I, it's okay. I was gonna say this next couple of weeks, I have a couple in live. Like you know, I'm I'm listening to some new artists, young artists playing down some bars in Nashville and some other places. And I just I'm gonna be doing that in Houston as well, going back and forth between Nashville and Houston, trying to look at the Texas, Tennessee. Um, and so I'll be I'll be checking you all out uh, out there. It's fun. And and believe it or not, I'm trying to buy tickets to a Herb Alpert show. He's still touring. He's in his 80s. And uh, he, yeah, he's, he's playing up in Chicago. And I, I got to remember to go do that today. There were a few tickets left. He and his wife are performing. Um, and he's one of my all time favorite mm -hmm. um, songwriters and, and performers. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, lo love him. Love him. Yeah. So uh, you got to let me know how, how that goes. First of all, you got to, I don't know if I said this already, you got to kiss Dale Pinner on the forehead for me. Yeah. <laughs> I do. I really have to do that? Yeah, do. You know, from Dale's the, a great guy. Yeah, Dale's a great yeah. guy. We had, we had fun at, at Springboard. I really appreciated meeting him. Uh, and, you know, as we are, you know, taping this today for the podcast, you know, we lost Tony Bennett. You know, that was oh, I, I saw that this, this morning. morning. 
Yeah. 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 It's such a, what a, what a legacy that he's left, huh? Absolutely. From, from early on, you know, working with people like Frank Sinatra to, to Lady Gaga to, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I actually ran into him at a restaurant a couple of years ago before his uh, Alzheimer diagnosis. Yeah. And, and yeah. I, um, I, it was his favorite Italian restaurant I used to go to in Chicago all the time. I just happened to be there that day. And it was so cool wow. um, to, to actually see him in person because I had never, um, uh, met him in person in that way, like outside of entertainment. Yeah. Um, so he, what a great, great guy. And uh, yeah, God bless for his contribution to music. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. How about Tom Jones being on the, have you seen it on the TV sh- uh, show singing? Uh, he's in some uh, the voice or something yeah, uh, somewhere. Amazing. I'm not sure where, if that's in the UK or, or whatever, his voice is still amazing. Wow. <laughs> Tom Jones is well, yeah, I, I met. Um, I think I mentioned to you that Mel Torme was a by marriage an uncle in my family, so oh, we really? grew up with that kind of beautiful music too. So, I just like so many genres. From uh, there's not a whole lot you can name except for uh, except for some of that rap out there. I really yeah, not yeah. a fan of that. Yeah. But but yeah. you know, yeah. music that lifts people up. I'm yeah. I'm all all about that. So Absolutely, I'm great. about healing music as well. Anybody who knows me for five minutes knows that. <laughs> I know, yeah, I know. But and I know you were hanging out with Danny Jones in Texas oh and God. man, he's he's wonderful too. Oh so you got God. all these terrific yeah. people out there helping other people. And Absolutely. that's just so much fun. And look at you. I mean I I didn't know about all your stuff and I just I've been watching past episodes of your show and you. and loving it. You're 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 on the fire, man. You're on fire. We're trying to make it happen. You know, I mean this is this is it. This is why we're on the planet and music is yeah. I, you know I didn't ask for it. It wasn't something that I hunted for or sought out. It was like God said, It's hey, inside, here. right? This is what's up. This is you. And so everything about music, I just, from the time, I think I was in the eighth grade, Doris, when I read Kenny Rogers and Lynn Eppin's book, Making It in Music. I'm eighth grade, right? And I'm thinking, wow, this is the first time I hear about copywriting and publishing. And at that time, of course, it was the record industry so the record labels and and it was just extraordinary to me it just caught me by storm and i remember i we're still friends to this day bass player stays down in maryland chris rhodes and uh you know we were in a band together doing junior high dances and whatnot and he was like man you need to put that down and pick up those drumsticks and get tighter on the drums and he was right but now you know he tells me man jerry i i wish i would have read those books because I absolutely needed it. I mean, that wasn't the first book I read, but it just absorbs you. And you go into this business of music and Donald Passman's book and other books that have just, you know, helped you to know how the industry works. And uh, I'm just as in love with that process as I am being a musician. Hence the entree <laughs> musician. That's, yeah, that's where it, it comes together. You bring yeah. the sides together. All the- Someone just asked me recently, like, you know, will I learn everything I need to know out of this book? And I, I said, there's no book, there's no one book there's that no teaches one. you. Right. And even if you read five or six of them, right. you still have to realize that the minute they're printed, they're out of date. That's correct. Because today's That's correct. world with the internet and with streaming, I mean, there's not a couple of weeks gone by that something major doesn't change involving social media and now there's threads and this and that. And then you got to read it carefully what's happening because then it affects some other social media thing. And, and, and you, it changes all the time in the reimbursement and even the attorneys don't really know. A lot of times they say, I don't know. It isn't, it isn't, it isn't even developed yet. Like, is it considered this, this question came up in a discussion this morning. Is it considered a public release? If you put a selfie video up of you singing a song mm. and you, you display it, is that, is that releasing the, the, the song? And some attorneys will tell you, yes, that is. And I kind of believe it is because you're getting fans. People are listening to it and you better darn well have it copywritten Absolutely. because if, before you do that, um, it, it is playing it in public, testing an audience. Is that public release? Yes, it is. Mm. You know, so, so right. legally there's some gray and people think people, I, I had somebody yesterday ask me, is it still 
official copyright if you mail it to yourself? Well, of course not. You know, that's not it. But that that wives tale has stuck around for so long. That, that, that was uh, already decimated 20 times. Yeah. I, I yeah, not, but I've not heard that question in a while. But you know, yeah, the I was chat surprised. GPT questions are coming up. Oh, with, you know, <laughs> for copyrights. The AI questions are, you know, just uh, rife. As a matter of fact, uh, our marketing uh, director, um, my personal marketing director, I would I would say that. But she's a she's a gem, uh, Izzy, and uh, you know, we were talking last night about the many directions that AI is going and Bobby O who's a great mixer. I mean, profound mixer, Bobby Ozinski, everybody should know his name is doing a course on the technology of AI in music production. Now. I mean, it's just all over the place and you have to yeah. consistently right. know what's happening. I'm not saying you have to be an expert at everything, but you have to be aware. This is how the industry is going and where is my place in it? Right. None of those anything. books have stuff in there about that because it's no. developing right now i spent the morning as well i i was on a two-hour meeting this morning about ai um and and what the results are and it wasn't just music industry related which is interesting it was about things in real estate things in law uh, things in medicine they spent a lot of time because uh, there's a big you know fear of it uh, writing writing notes and making prescriptions and making conclusions about the diagnosis for patients. And, you know, we're seeing it all over the place in uh, education. It's affecting universities. There was a professor there on the call. Um, and so it, it wasn't so much a fear. It was a exploration type call of, of okay, we, we need to do this well world because if we don't do it well, um, there could be dire consequences to the foundations of our legacy, of our learning. And I, I think, uh, you know, musicians and, and creators are on the front line with it because of the deep fakes and because of, I mean, did you see the Johnny Cash song about Barbie World out there? And it's amazing, right? It makes you want to listen to it. I listened to the whole thing like three times. Yeah. Uh, but is it is it good or bad? Everybody's like, well, it's good good quality but it's bad technique right it's just like 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 johnny cash would be mortified that he'd be out there singing i'm in a barbie world you know but but, but i, I don't know imagination I, I, is an amazing thing and uh as far as the technology can take us the imagination about the technology will take us even further because that's yeah. just who we are yeah. Can you imagine a world for musicians where a lot of the mundane tasks that they have to do, whether it's posting content, creating content for social media, or it's it's recording all of your publishing details over and over again into 100 different sites, if it secretarial wise can support the efforts of musicians that are spending way too much time, doctors are spending way too much time on their electronic medical record systems and charting notes, so, right? If we can get them back to the majority of time being spent the patient, treating the patient, we get the majority of time of an artist back to performing and sharing and writing music versus doing all this stuff. I feel like a lot of artists, they're just scrambling to all day long document and social media. Yeah. And, and I hate that. I hate that there has to be a better way. Absolutely. So. And I, I think, too, and one of the things that we teach in, in our course is the fact that you have to pick one or two. I mean, you know, all the rage was post five times a day and just blanket everything, Instagram, Facebook, da, 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 da. That is chasing your tail. You know, mm -hmm. find out where you're getting some traction and then throw the rest off and engage with the people who are engaging with you, because that brings it back to you and Agree. your customer you and your client, you and your fan, however you choose to designate them. But man, if you're spending eight hours a day, you know, on social media, where are you in the music production or the music composition? It just don't, it doesn't work. It will not produce fruit for you whatsoever. I think, I think we're going to see evolution in that over time as people understand and balance out. I, I think it's exhausting a lot of people. I mean, right now we're dealing with crisis in, in 
uh, remuneration for, for artists, right? That's the big crisis is we don't have enough. And, you know, hopefully we get artists and other groups like that will, will, will bring some, some resolution, um, as Barry says, revolution, right? Uh, to things because we need to be paying people differently. That's why the writers are on strike. You know, unfortunately we don't have a national union for musicians because there is nobody to fight those battles. And it, and it's really rough that we don't have that type of representation. That's why the mo movie industry, probably even in today's world, is paid much better than the than the musician world is. Not, not I'm not I'm saying that as a generality. That's not for everybody, but but I'm saying we're we are in a. I think we're at a critical point in that many many artists today cannot um, do music full time because they can't make a living at it full time. And, and people like to point fingers at record labels and, and, and publishers. And, I, and I'll tell you, at least the independent ones, we're not making any more than the musicians make, right? Um, we depend on that, that relationship together. Um, I understand, and I'm not trying to villainize the, the major labels out there, but there has been an, a great imbalance. And I think when we balance out the payment systems and we pay people fairly so that streaming does get paid fairly and songwriting does get paid fairly and, and equally to the publishing and to the, to the records that are made, who finances those, there should be a balance between all those. It should be very even. I think that's just my opinion. And I, I think we're, I think we're totally imbalanced and it's caused people not to be able to do their craft and how productive can you be being, you know, yeah. Or if you're a bartender and you got to work really hard and on your feet, how energetic are you going to be the next morning after working, you know, late? Um, I, I, my company, we always try to employ our artists. So we find a role that they're good at. Hey, you're good at video editing. You're good at filmmaking. You're good at social media. You're good. Hey, let's pay the artists to, to help the companies. I view it as like a co-op in a way. It's not a formal co-op. But I think if every label out there, and I'm talking the big ones and the little ones, all worked like a co-op and the publishers to go, we're going to make sure that musicians, songwriters, um, actors, whomever, variety acts, um, that we are going to give you the money. We, we reinvest the money that we make and give it to you to have a job so that you can focus full time on your art and your craft. And you don't have to worry about the side jobs because then it's a win-win, right? They're getting paid. You're getting good trusted labor. You form a deeper relationship and, and you have somebody, you've, you've developed a skill now that in the down days, because music goes like this, you're hot or not, right? And, and some days you're you're killing it because you got the, that TikTok video went viral. And other days you're, you're, you're waiting around going, how come the phone's not ringing? Um, so you, you have to really dig in there. And I, I, again, my model may be a little bit unique. I know there are some other companies like this, but I think we need a lot more of them. I agree with you 100%. I want to tell you, I appreciate you being here with me, but you have to an answer the most important question. That oh, oh, what's that? Today. It's, it's the most important. I mean, over 35 years of really making it happen, doing what you do very, very well. Again, your track record is absolutely excellent, but I don't know the answer to this question, Doris. Okay. And that's how in the world did you meet Barry Coffin? <laughs> Do I have to answer that on this show? <laughs> well, actually, that's the most important question. It's like, oh my goodness, you know. Well, we, we got, Barry. we got, we love <laughs> We got hooked up together, met each other because um, a a vice president of my company at the time, Adam McIntosh introduced us as we were working on Springboard Chicago. And he asked me because uh, uh, I'm very familiar with Chicago being that that was my hometown I was born in. And I've lived back and forth there between there and Nashville and, and New York and other places. And so he came to me and said, let's work together. And then that one got sort of turned into a virtual event because the pandemic hit right when we were working on planning it. Um, and then we got, he found out that my background was in very much areas that, that 
you know, was around where he was working with, with software and everything. And we just sort of hit it off and went from there. So uh, we become good friends and uh, he's a wonderful guy, great mentor uh, to me. And uh, hopefully he feels the same and, and we've uh, collaborated on a lot of stuff, but there's so many great people in here. And, and again, my sweet spot's been sort of, you know, Chicago to Nashville to Houston and back and forth, kind of that route. And then every once in a while, I go the other direction, Washington, D.C., New York and L.A. So it's a it's across the U.S. Um, I have worked overseas, though. I have worked with a number of people overseas and actually worked for three years in the U.K. and Scotland. So uh, uh, in, in, in different areas, not so much in music, but we have we have people we work with over there, too. So um, I, I really view music as the you know, equal to equal uh, eyes are across the world. You know, it doesn't matter your age, again, your race, your sex, your, your genre, people have a shared love. And, and that that's, that's why, you know what, people who are ill, they turn to music, they play it in the hospitals for them, because it brings back their memories. Sometimes it brings back, it, it cheers them up. And, and it's such a healing power. Uh, takes people out of depression. Just writing lyrics down on paper can sometimes be the f- treeing it and flooring it that you need to get out of your funk, to get more productive. Um, so when you feel angry, write it down, right? Don't punch somebody. Go write it down. Uh, so it's good. So that's how I met him. That was the story. And it's turned into a beautiful friendship and and uh, it really enjoy it. And get to meet nice people like you who come to Springboard. And, and do certain things. So uh, it's, it, it's great. But this has been so much fun. You said we're going to have a conversation. You know how much I love to talk. So it's pretty easy to keep me. Uh, well, I tell uh, you what, this, this won't be the last one. That's that's the whole thing, ah. that, you know, once we started. But there's, you know, you are a deep well. I mean that wholeheartedly. And there's so much that we were not able to get into today. You know, I'm going to give you a call and say, hey, what do you think if the focus is just on this? Because you have so much experience and knowledge as to how an artist should do this that or the other we can just focus on uh different topics yeah it's very it's very cool i mean i do i have certain loves of things like you know touring and yeah creating there's a group uh run by maxim uh yago i don't know if you know him or not uh does the creativity conference uh it's coming up actually in august uh they're doing it virtual this year it does take place in iceland uh, sometimes it's taken place other other places. Maxim has been involved in uh, uh, Cannes Film Festival. He he's an amazing person, and and uh, they should check into that conference. But um, you know, o- oftentimes he'll bring in speakers, and the topics are wonderful about motivation and about um, uh, just how to be creative. And I, I did a talk there once for him on how to find that hidden muse. You know what what happens if the muse isn't there, and you just feel one day. I just can't write anymore. I've had artists do that. I'm done writing. Haven't written anything in five months. What do I do? I used to write a song a day. It's just blank right now. And you have to get down to the reason. Well, what happened? What happened to cause that? What life change did you go through? What stressor did you go through? And then usually just there's a way to start talking about things that allows you to bring out that creativity. So that's a whole nother area. But you're right. I mean, this industry is complex enough. There's many things. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty good generalist, but I know some specifics about, about things, too. So and I, if I make a little bit of difference in some people's life, I figured it's a life well lived. Well, you so I, an incredible I, amount of difference. I mean, you have. Well, that's thank just you. Not me saying that. You know, my nose is brown enough. I don't have to say anything. I don't. Know anything <laughs> no. about. We haven't oh, talked about you. your book, so you know we're going to have you. You know, talk. About I'm going to be writing some other ones, so yes. you just wait. <laughs> I know you are. Well, this is Derice G. She's from Synapse Publishing and Entertainment. You have to look her up. Go to the website that you see at the bottom of your screen. She's extremely accessible. And by that, she told you when, what calls she takes and what calls she doesn't. But, you know, you tell her, Jerry told me to call. She'll probably. Call. So. <laughs> I'll, take, I'll, I'll take that one, right? So <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Jerry, eat. yeah, okay. Email is the best way to get a hold of me because that's the one thing I check every day and get through all my emails every day. And so, that's at uh, Therese G at, at That's right. Okay. <laughs> that's right. Thank you very Thank much. You. I appreciate the time. I appreciate you. I really do. And um, we'll be talking soon. You can believe it. 
that's going to do it for this episode of the Andre Musician. That was a wonderful conversation. I enjoyed myself. I know you will too, which is why I always ask that you like, subscribe to the Andre Musician and share. Definitely go to the entremusician.com to learn more about our community. It is growing and that's because one by one, sometimes two by two, sometimes three, sometimes three. They join and uh, we hook up. But my name is Jerry B. It's fun doing this. It's fun talking to wonderful people like Louise. And it's great knowing that you're here with me. Please check us out online. Have a great day. And I forgot to say the tag. My name is Jerry B. I'm the Andre Musician. And so are you. We will absolutely see you next time. God bless.